Good morning, everyone. It's Pastor Dan. It's Tuesday morning. Welcome to our senior adults uh, Bible study class. This morning's lesson is about trusting God. And so I thought it was appropriate that we sing some hymns about trusting God. So today in our hymn books, we're going to start with uh, 390, Trust and Obey. It's so sweet to trust in Jesus. Thank you. 
to 403. What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> favorite. No more. 
Okay, yes. Hey guys, good morning. Uh, we're ready to get into our lesson this morning. We're in the journey into knowing God. Uh, today we're going to be looking at lesson number eight. Don't worry, trust God. We're looking at the names of God. And today the name that we're going to be looking at is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh. Jireh means my provider. So we're excited about that. I think it's very timely, uh, this lesson for this time uh, that we're going through, that we, we need to know that God is our provider. He's going to take care of us. So let's get right into the lesson. <clears throat> we're on page 36 in your journey into knowing God, the names of God. Lesson eight. Over and over in the Bible, God promises to meet our, all our needs. In this lesson, we would get to know God as Jehovah Jireh, the name that sums up all of those promises. Thus far in this study, we have become acquainted with God as Elohim, Jehovah, El Elyon, Adonai, El Roy, El Shaddai, and El Olam. The first time we find the name Jehovah Jireh is in Genesis 22:14a. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. This name for God is transliterated Jehovah Jireh in the King James Version. Since the word Lord is in all caps, we know it is the name Jehovah. The Hebrew word Jireh means will provide. This name for God is first used in connection with the ultimate test of Abraham's faith. In Genesis 21, the Lord tells Abraham to send Ishmael away. With Ishmael gone, the stage is set for the supreme test of Abraham's faith the sacrifice of his only son, whom he loved. Now God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on a mountain that he will show him. Abraham immediately obeys, leaving early the next morning for Mount Moriah with Isaac and two servants. When they arrive at the foot of the mountain, Abram tells his servants to wait while he and Isaac go on. Then what does Abraham say he is going to do in Genesis 22, 5b? It says he's going to go worship. This is the first time the word worship is found in the Bible. So we find here the key to understanding this word elsewhere in the Bible. The Hebrew word translated worship means to bow down in homage or reverence in submission. I think we need to be very careful about calling a music leader the worship pastor or leader because it can imply that worship is the music. Worship is not the music. Music helps us to prepare to worship. The music should get our hearts ready to submit to the Word of God. That's why the music is before the sermon. Why did the wise men or magi say they were searching for Jesus in Matthew 2.2? 2? It says they were searching for him so that they could worship him. They wanted to worship the Lord. When Abraham reaches the top of the mountain, <clears throat> he prepares to worship by building an altar and arranging wood on it. He then ties Isaac, lays him on the word, wood, and picks up a knife to sacrifice him. This is perhaps the greatest act of faith in the Old Testament because Abraham knows God's promises to him are all wrapped up in Isaac. In his mind, how could Abraham reconcile the sacrifice of his only son with God's promise? that the, the, the entire world would be blessed through his seed. In Hebrews eleven nineteen, it explains it this way, that Abraham understood that God could raise the dead. Though no resurrection had ever occurred, <clears throat> Abram believed the God who had miraculously given him a son once could certainly do it again, even if it meant raising Isaac from the dead. Abraham is the first person in the Bible to believe that God can raise the dead. That's pretty awesome. As Abraham is on the verge of sacrificing Isaac, his only son of promise, a voice from heaven <clears throat> tells him not to harm the boy. Seeing a ram with its horns caught in a thicket, Abraham sacrifices it instead of Isaac. Then for the first time in the Bible, God is called Jehovah Jireh the Lord will provide. This name is best expressed in what promise found in Philippians 4.19. God will supply all my needs according to his glorious riches available to me in Christ Jesus. This is a very inclusive promise. However, we can only take advantage of this promise if we know God as Jehovah Jireh. Knowing God as Jehovah Jireh dispels our worry by enabling us to trust God 
in at least two ways. And we're going to look at those. I want to go back a little bit, talking about worshiping the Lord. Abraham was in the act of obedience when he was worshiping the Lord. You know, it's, it, it's real difficult if you're not obeying God, if you're not living in obedience to his word and, you know, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself and being kind to one another and all the things that we know as the Christian lifestyle entails, that if we're not doing those things, we're not living in obedience to God, then then it doesn't matter how good you sing or how good you play or, or that you want to sing songs or hymns or whatever it is. Worship is obedience. It's an obedience lifestyle. Our, the best worship. See, Abraham was worshiping God by being obedient to what God asked him. Even when it was beyond understanding, it was hard for him to grasp what God was trying to do and what God had asked him to do. But Abraham believed God. And he said, I'm going to obey God. And in the process, I know that God would provide uh, the lamb. and God himself would provide the lamb. God would make a way. God is our provider. And so as we live our lives <clears throat> in obedience to God's word, doing what God has called us to do, each one of us, as we live in obedience to him, we can declare that Jehovah is our provider, that God will provide if we're living in obedience to him. When we're, when we're living in disobedience to God, we're living in sin, we're willfully living in sin, we're, we're not obeying God, we're not doing the things that we know we should be doing, then, you know, we can't expect God to provide. Now, sometimes he does out of his great mercy, his loving kindness, he definitely does provide for us, he does, definitely does bless us in many different ways. But for us to get in that place where God can provide joyfully and, and just overflowing to us is when we are in a place of obedience <clears throat> when we are obeying God. And that's what Abraham was doing. Okay. So we got to trust God by giving him all of your problems. Life is a series of problems. When we have problems or troubles, we need to know God <clears throat> as Jehovah Jireh. What does God promise in Psalm 50 verse 15? He says, and call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. What a great promise, you know, as we're facing all this nonsense with the coronavirus, and it's a serious pandemic, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we have to trust God uh, that he's going to provide. He's going to take care of our needs. Whatever they may be, God's going to provide. And so it's nice that we can call upon him in this day of trouble, and today God still answers us and we will glorify him for his answers. It says, if you don't know God as Jehovah Jireh, we sometimes make our problems worse by hurriedly trying to solve them ourselves. By doing this, we short circuit God. Remember, in the last lesson, we discovered that faith waits. Every promise in the Bible has a premise. Part of that premise is almost always that we must wait on God in faith. Some Christians are struggling with financial problems because they don't know God as Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. They buy things they can't afford to impress people they don't even like. As a result, they are up to their eyeballs in debt. Then instead of waiting on God, they stop tithing. They cheat on their taxes. They get into unethical business deals, <clears throat> etc. In Jeremiah 2, 13, how does God <clears throat> describe those who forsake him in their trouble and try to solve their own problems. It says they have uh, hewed, they have hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, <clears throat> they're trying to solve their problems themselves. They're, they're trying to, you know, he says some people get in debt and then they're trying to figure out, well, how do I get out of debt? What do I need to do? And, you know, we need to work our way out of debt, <clears throat> stay out of debt as much as we can. And, but we need to trust God. We need to just wait on God. Uh, you know, just say, God, I know you're going to provide and, and we need to deal with our finances the right way, do the right things in our business dealings and with, you know, our taxes and everything else. Then we need to just sit back and say, God, I'm, I'm just going to trust you to provide. And listen, when you have problems and don't trust God as Jehovah Jireh, you dig your own cistern. A cistern is a reservoir for storing water. In other words, your efforts make things worse. When people can't solve their own problems, many turn to alcohol, prescription drugs, or even illegal drugs. These are cisterns 
that can hold no water. <clears throat> Others dig their own cisterns by thinking a person can fulfill their needs. Many people are unhappy and disappointed in a relationship because they are trusting in a person to meet all their needs and make them happy. Only God can do that. We sometimes hear people saying, oh, he completes me or she completes me. Only Jesus completes you, okay? Only Jesus can complete you. That person compliments you. In other words, that person will cover your weaknesses, you know, and you cover each other's weaknesses, you help each other's strengths, and, and that's how that marital relationship works. But neither one of us is perfect. I cannot complete uh, Veronica, and she cannot complete me. Only Christ can complete us. And so we look to him. We have to not look at a relationship or a friend. You know, if you're you're younger and you're dating and you're, you're trying, sometimes we have that mentality. We're looking for someone that will complete us and make us a perfect uh, couple. We're looking for that perfect person or that perfect uh, individual when instead we ought to be working on becoming a perfect person or in other words, the person that is that somebody else would want to marry. In other words, we need to work on ourselves, living right, serving God, loving God. God will send the right person along, you know, and he'll help you build that relationship. And no matter how perfect that person may be for you, you're still going to have to work out through some issues. That's just human nature. But we are not to look at that person as somebody who can complete us or someone who can, in which we find all our happiness, you know, that we're going to find all our happiness in this one person. No, all our happiness is found in Christ. We can find happiness in our spouse and in our families. And I thank God for that. We'll also have a lot of heartache in all our relationships. Only Jesus will never let us down. We, we need, he is our, our cistern that can hold water and that can satisfy. Uh, it says many people are unhappy and disappointed in a relationship because they are trusting in a person to meet all their needs and make them happy. Only God can do that. That's why we have what promise about God in Psalm 145, verse 16. It says he opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Don't worry, trust God by giving him all your problems. The second thing is that we trust God by giving him first priority. At times, all of us have our Isaacs that become very dear to us and may take God's place as number one in our lives. Your Isaac may be a career, a hobby, an investment, an education or a relationship. It is whatever keeps God from having first priority in your life. <clears throat> from time to time, all of us must go to our Mount Moriahs, where we must be willing to sacrifice things that are squeezing God out of first place in our lives. Like Abraham, we may not be required to dispose of those things, but we may be asked to make a clear commitment to God that they will be second to him. You will never know God as Jehovah Jireh unless he is number one in your life. How do you know what is number one in your life? You have to examine at least two things. Number one says here, we must examine our checkbook. The way you spend money reveals what's really number one in your life. How does Jesus express this truth in Luke 12, 34? For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Therefore, you need to examine your giving and the attitude with which you give. If God is number one in our lives, we will not only give, we will give cheerfully. I think giving cheerfully is like when you're coming to some money and you can't wait uh, to pay your tithe. I've had people do that in our own church that, you know, they'd come in the middle of the wing and they'd say, well, you know, I just, I just got this money. I can't, and I'm anxious to come and pay my tithe on it. Now, that's very honorable. I love that. I think it's very beautiful to have that spirit in every one of us that, you know, you know, I'm not going to wait until, you know, I got this money today. I don't really want to, I, I don't want to wait until said, I want to go ahead and give it. I'm so excited about giving uh, this amount and, and, and giving my tithe. And, uh, you know, we thank God that we can do that. But giving cheerfully means, man, I can't wait. I can't wait till payday so I can pay my tithes and, and, and bless my community, bless, invest in my church family. And so we thank God for all of that. Thank God for your faithfulness. So we examine our checkbook. And the second thing it says in the lesson that we should examine our calendar. The fourth and longest of the Ten Commandments involves our calendars. What command, what does God command in Exodus 20 verse 8? It says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. 
The key to understanding this command is the word holy. The word translated holy means set apart for God or dedicated to God. <clears throat> the word Sabbath does mean rest, but it means more. How does the first phrase of Leviticus 23.3 describe the Sabbath? It says it is a day of holy convocation or a holy assembly. The phrase holy convocation means a sacred assembly or corporate worship. In other words, we come to church once a week to worship God and study his word. Uh, you know, in many places they don't have buildings. And so they come together uh, on a weekly basis sometimes in their homes uh, and they meet together at a place that whenever the people of God together get together, wherever they are, that's church. We're doing it through this video technology. You're listening in and you're from your home. And, you know, I'm here at the church right now. And we're, ha we're having a sacred assembly right now. As we're meeting together, we're, we're worshiping, we're praying, we're fellowshipping this way, and, and we're studying the Word of God. This is a sacred assembly. This is part of what we, what we would do, like what we do on Sundays. We come together, uh, you know, when we can come together as a church family, we worship God, we serve God. Then the rest of the day, you know, we don't do any work. We, we just sanctify it unto the Lord. We say, no, I'm, I'm going to use this day to just rest. So Sunday afternoon naps are good, you know, walk down the beach or, you know, piddling around in our garden, vegetable garden in the backyard. Uh, not not as work, but it's just just to relax <clears throat> uh, for for fun and to enjoyment. The Sabbath is a gift. The Sabbath day was a gift that God gave us for us to take care of ourselves and to be nourished and to be uh, taken care of. Right. So that we can be refreshed. We can be re-energized. To know God as Jehovah Jireh, like Abraham did, we must give him first priority in our lives. Jesus said we must first seek God's kingdom and righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The phrase, all these things will be added to you, is summed up in one word in Hebrew, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. Knowing God well enough not to worry requires that you must trust God by giving him all your problems and trust God by giving him first priority. So our lesson for today is trusting God. Uh, uh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, it was a chorus we used to sing way back in the day. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, my provider, the Lord is sufficient for thee, for thee, for thee. Remember that one? Some of y'all might remember that. Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. We're going to thank him for provision. We're going to pray for our nation, for all the needs that we have. Uh, you know, I know that things are changing every day with this coronavirus thing. And we just want to pray and ask God for wisdom for our nation and that we could get back to work and back to back to doing the things that we need to do. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you that we can trust you. We thank you that you are our provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. We can trust you, Father to come through for us, Lord, as we live in obedience to your word, as we do what we need to do with our time and with our money, Lord, and we, we love you, we honor you. You continue to provide, you continue to bless. Father, we thank you for your manifold blessings. We thank you for safety, for health and protection in these times, Lord. Father, we lift up our president, his staff, the coronavirus task force, Lord, all, all his leaders, Lord, and administration, <clears throat> Lord, his family, that you keep them safe, that you give him wisdom, give all these men and women wisdom as they lead this nation through this pandemic. Father, we pray that uh, we would be able to soon get back to work, get back to doing things, Lord, and be, be, be able to come together again as a church family to worship you together, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you give us wisdom in reopening the economy. We pray for those who have lost jobs, Lord, those who have, even those who have lost loved ones, Father, through doing this, during this time, over 22,000 in America have lost their lives to this virus. Father, we pray that the plague be stopped in the name of Jesus, Lord, and that the economy would uh, be restarted and that it would just roar back to life and, and that you would make up those, those times and those finances and that provision that has been lost during this time. Father, we're believing for that. Father, I pray a, a hedge of protection, <clears throat> safety, and health around all of our faith assembly of God church family, and every single one of them, Lord. Let, let us not have anybody, Lord, that will succumb to this virus. Father, we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Bless our seniors 
and their families. Keep them safe from all harm. Bless and provide for them. Jehovah Jireh. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Thanks, thanks for uh, tuning in today. And uh, next week, we'll go on to the next lesson. And uh, <clears throat> don't know how long this will all last, but together we're going to make it through, okay? God bless you. Love you guys. Can't wait to see you and hug your neck again. Be blessed.